So we might get started then. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land of which all of us work and live. I'm personally broadcasting from Canberra today, so I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people in and around the Canberra region. I acknowledge their, um, their knowledge of country and its changing climate long into the past and into the current and present as well, and the value of the traditional knowledge which tells powerful stories about how our weather and climate is impacting our ecosystems and environments. I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. In today's webinar, we have two presenters from Monash University. Our first speaker today will be Ailey Gallant. Ailey is a senior lecturer in the School of Earth and Atmosphere and Environment at Monash University. Ali has experience in climate variability, drought and drought processes. Her research has a focus on the role of climate variability and drought processes associated with rainfall on weather and climate timescales and its influence on drought. After Ailey, we'll have a presentation from Tess Parker. And Tess is a postdoctoral research fellow in the School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment at Monash University. Tess works on identifying and understanding flash drought in Australia. Her expertise stems from a background in climate dynamics, heat waves, and atmospheric processes associated with drought development. Both Tess and Ailey contribute to the Hub's research project on understanding past, present, and future climate variability and change. So I think we'll dive straight into it and I'll pass over to Ailey to begin. Thanks, Ailey. Thanks very much, Sonia. Uh, thanks for the introduction, the lovely introduction there. And thank you everybody for attending today. So I'd like to start with a little story uh, about something that happened in 2015. Uh, 2015 uh, was an interesting year. It was a, a very severe El Nino, uh, one of the, the strongest on record, but Australia hadn't been hit too bad. Um, and neither had uh, Victoria, and that's where we're going to be focusing on here. So uh, the area that I'm thinking about here is kind of the Wimmera Mallee country, so Western Victoria, Northwestern Victoria, and kind of across the border a little bit into South East and South Australia. As I said, uh, things hadn't been too bad in this region through the winter. The year was on the dry side, uh, but not, not too dry. We certainly weren't in drought conditions. And the crop season seemed to be going reasonably well. The start of September looked quite promising. Uh, it was cool and a pretty decent amount of rain actually fell in the first week of September. As I said before, things were a little on the dry side, but to quote uh, the beginning of this ABC Rural article, uh, the farmers were kind of of the opinion that as long as it doesn't get too hot, we should actually be okay. But of course, as September moved on, the weather transformed and transformed quite quickly. Uh, into something that looked more and more like summer. And by the start of October, the soils were baked dry. And many of the pulse crops, uh, particularly the pulse crops throughout the Wimmera were decimated. You can see the 2015-16 year here. Uh, the blue line shows uh, the chickpea yield in tonnes per hectare, and the green line shows the total in kilotons. And you can see that particularly for things like chickpeas, um, this was not a good year ultimately stemming out uh, from this situation in October. So what happened? Basically uh, a flash drought, which is what we're going to talk to you about today. So what you can see from these plots here, uh, and I'll show you the progression of the flash drought and show you how quick it was. So this is what we call the normalised difference vegetation index. Now, uh, on the left here, I have what we call the raw values of the normalised difference vegetation index, and on the right is the anomaly, so the difference from normal. Now, the normalised ve uh, difference vegetation index, or the NDVI, basically shows you the, an indication of the, the health of vegetation based on satellite data. So numbers that are uh, kind of above around 0.33, given indication of relatively healthy vegetation. So that's the green colours, kind of the, the, the lime greens into the dark greens, the darker greens, the healthier the vegetation. And uh, values that are into the yellows and the browns tend to start to indicate uh, stressed vegetation. So into the yellows, that's uh, stress, getting into moderate stress, and the browns are um, very stressed. So just have a look on the left, the raw values, and on the right, the, the anomalies, the differences from normal. So you can see that even though we had a somewhat dry winter, as we got into uh, early spring, 
things are looking okay. The, you can see the anomalies compared to normal. We've got nice, uh, broadly speaking, healthy vegetation across Western Victoria, and that's around what's uh, expected normally for this time of year. Not, not too bad. Um, parts of Southern Victoria were, but not in the Northwest. Seeing in a second. There we go. And as we moved into September, uh, that burst of rain at the start of September had everything uh, going well. And again, the anomalies aren't looking too bad. But as we moved into October, uh, you can see that the, the satellite retrievals here start to indicate quite stressed vegetation. Uh, as we move into October, uh, more stress than normal for this time of year. And by November, uh, things were looking quite dire with very stressed vegetation across much of the Wimmera Mallee, uh, which is much more stressed than normal. So this is the perfect example of a flash drought. What happened here happened over the space of a few weeks and uh, Tess is going to talk to you more specifically about what happened later and drill down into some of the specifics of the processes that took place throughout this flash drought. Uh, but we're going to talk more broadly about flash drought today too. So first I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of flash uh, drought and then I'll talk about some of the results that we've achieved as part of the Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub that looked at some of the tools that we could use to identify a flash drought in Australia, what they tell us about flash drought in Australia more broadly and what they can tell us about our flash drought processes, just a few things. And then finally, Tess Parker, who has, I should say, done most of the work that we've presented here today, will tell you about the Wimmera event in 2015. And she'll use that as a case study to really highlight an example of the processes uh, leading to a flash drought in Australia. So first I want to talk about drought in general, because when we think about drought, we often think of drought as really something in the climate variability part of the weather climate spectrum. So what this plot shows here is just a kind of example of the time and the space scale, so small time scales uh, to the left of the x-axis here and small spatial scales on the bottom of the y-axis. And if we kind of move out towards, you know, months, years, decades, centuries in time, and the same goes larger and larger spatial scales as we go up the y-axis, we can think about kind of weather and then climate variability and climate change associated with this spectrum of, of time and spatial scales. When we think about drought, we typically think of drought being kind of a, a climate variability phenomenon. So typically drought, uh, as we've thought of it until recently, has occurred on, you know, order of kind of seasons to years and even decades, if we're thinking about things like the millennium drought. And we've, you know, people have traditionally categorised drought into to four main categories. So meteorological drought, which is associated with rainfall deficits, which tend to be on the shorter time scale on the order of seasons, maybe months to seasons to years. Agricultural drought, when you get that uh, effect then on soil moisture uh, and you get um, impacts on, on things like cropping but that tends to occur on the longer time scale uh, of, of seasons to years again. Hydrological drought, when that has a, a cascading effect on hydrological systems, which tends to occur more like years to decades. And of course, socioeconomic can branch out across that spectrum. Um, it's really just any drought that gives a, a very strong, um, or has a severe impact on, on society or the economy. But flash drought is an interesting phenomenon because it's not usually what we think of as drought because it actually tends to occur a lot more quickly than we've thought of drought in the past. So flash drought we might actually describe as a more sub-seasonal uh, phenomena. And I suppose that flash drought in that sense, I should, I should say, we'll, we'll, I'll show you this later, flash drought can though last a long time. We think of flash, we think of kind of on and off, um, but flash drought isn't necessarily defined by its duration, it's more defined by its rapid onset, which I'll describe in a second. So the literature to date has really described flash droughts evolving very rapidly. This is the example I showed before. This was September in the top and November in the bottom. Uh, and what Tess will show you later is that this flash drought really happened over the course of effectively three weeks uh, at the end of September, beginning of October. 
It's a term that was first uh, described by Mark Svoboda, who is the director of the um, of the uh, the drought mitigate, I think it's drought mitigation center in, in Lincoln, Nebraska in the United States. He first coined the term in 2002. And uh, Jason Otkin has done a lot of this work and he had a fantastic review paper in uh, the, Bureau, uh, the, the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society in 2018, if anybody's interested. And he described this as a, a drought with rapid rate of intensification. And he also described that it's not about the duration of the event, it's about the rapid rate of intensification. And a, a, recent paper that I was involved in with Andrew Pendergrass uh, described this as well, but really highlighted the fact that this is a drought that occurs on sub-seasonal timescales rather than the seasonal timescales that we're typically interested in with drought. So flash droughts can be rapid, uh, very rapid onset. Flash droughts can also be very devastating. So this is an example of a flash drought that occurred in the Midwest of the United States in 2012 and it really devastated their corn crop. So the, the, the plot on the left here basically shows uh, the proportion of the US corn crop that was in uh, exceptional drought in the very dark red, extreme drought in the red, severe drought in the orange and moderate drought in the, the kind of peachy color there. And what you can see is that nearly 90% of the entire US corn crop was under moderate drought in 2012 by the time this flash drought set in and around 50% was in uh, extreme drought. And consequently, uh, US corn yield for 2012 uh, was very low compared to the previous years, despite the fact that they had uh, quite an increase in yield over time, uh, 2012 was not a good year. So flash droughts can be rapid, and flash droughts can be devastating in terms of their impact on agriculture. So how does a flash drought work? Uh, so this schematic kind of describes that and I'll walk you through it. But what I want to show you is that if we think about a flash drought um, happening, if we kind of think about um, the processes at play, we're going from the left to the right of the image here. So flash drought tends to be associated with uh, pretty much a, a cutoff of precipitation. So you might have a situation where uh, you might have, um, it might be, as I said, the dry side of normal, it could be quite wet. Um, as, you know, there's, there's a lot of different situations in which flash drought, drought can start. Um, but the idea is that at the beginning of a flash drought, um, soil moisture is not super dry. It might be on the dry side of normal, it might be a little bit wet, might be around normal. But then you effectively get a, a complete cutoff of precipitation. Um, at the start of that, that's okay. We might have had some precipitation, things are going around as normal. Um, that lack of precipitation cuts off the moisture supply. We might have fairly low evaporative demand from the atmosphere, but things aren't too bad. What tends to then, um, start off the flash drought is the meteorology, the weather systems. And this is why we have flash drought as a sub-seasonal um, timescale kind of phenomenon, because you start to get uh, very prolonged warm conditions or hot temperatures, you get clear skies, you get high radiative loading at the surface, so lots of, lots of radiation um, tends to be associated with a lot of high pressure systems or perhaps a heat wave or a warm spell. And because your surface has a sufficient amount of moisture, you get an increase in evapotranspiration. And you can get quite a sudden increase in evapotranspiration, as Tess will show you later. That can uh, very rapidly deplete soil moisture. And as soil moisture starts to be depleted, uh, our evapotranspiration decreases just because there's no moisture available. But we also start to get a lot of what we call sensible heating from the surface. So the surface heat fluxes in terms of actual heat increase as well. Um, we've got very low evapotranspiration that tends to dry out the lower atmosphere from below, as well as having a meteorological situation that's um, encouraging a dry atmosphere from above. We have very high evaporative demand for what little water there is, and all of that leads to uh, a surface that is very dry, is very hot, well usually quite hot for the time of year at least, and that lack of soil moisture and often the heat is what devastates the crops. 
So if we think about that from an evaporation perspective, because that seems to be what's quite important for flash drought is the evaporation part of the equation. Not, over, not only a, a shutoff in precipitation, which increases the risk, but then this kind of evaporation profile. So if we think about uh, this evaporation profile down the bottom associated with the schematic up the top, I've got the green line here showing, um, green line here showing evapotranspiration and the uh, red line showing what we call potential evapotranspiration. That, so that's the evaporation that would occur should we have um, unlimited water supply. Okay, so we can think about that as the evaporative demand. So evapotranspiration is what's actually happening on the ground. Potential evapotranspiration effectively depends on the atmospheric conditions overlying the surface. And what happens when we move from um, normal, normal conditions or near normal conditions into a flash drought is that we have uh, an increase in evapotranspiration as we have the, the energy conditions to encourage evapotranspiration from the surface, but then we get to a point where um, we start to be water limited because the soil starts to dry out too much and we get a, a sudden and rapid uh, um, decrease in evapotranspiration. Meanwhile, potential evapotranspiration is increasing uh, throughout that period. So that's a flash drought. Uh, and it's, they're typically described as a kind of spring summer events um, in the traditional seasons, especially down south in southern Australia or, you know, in the, in the midwest of the US, for example, because of these necessity uh, for conditions that have kind of a high evaporative demand. But the question is, I suppose, is it the same in Australia? Maybe it's the same in southern Australia, maybe northern Australia is quite different. Um, there's been some fantastic work done on flash drought in Australia, but the broad picture um, about the processes and about how it works, um, what it's related to is kind of still unclear at this point. And there's a lot of work to do in this area. So that's what we've done as part of this project. Uh, we've had a look at some of the metrics for assessing flash drought. Using these ideas, uh, people have used these ideas of, of changes in evaporation or potential evaporation uh, to think about different metrics that we can use to assess flash drought. Uh, a lot of people have used the evaporative stress index, so that's the ESI here, and that's just a function of the ratio between evapotranspiration and potential evapotranspiration here. So the ESI, the evaporative stress index, I've just kind of shown what it would uh, theoretically look like um, in this darker line here. There's also the evaporative demand drought index, which thinks about uh, this kind of evaporative demand, the thirst of the atmosphere effectively. So that is a function of potential evaporation alone. And if some people have actually looked at the standardized precipitation index as well, which is just um, a, a function of the precipitation. So all these indices basically just effectively standardize uh, this ratio, the potential evaporation or precipitation, uh, into a way that can be looked at in kind of a percentile framework where, you know, you might have um, a high value indicating uh, very uh, wet conditions and a low value indicating very dry conditions, which I'll talk about in a second. So the data that we've used for this study, we have stuck with what we call the ERA-5 global reanalysis product. Reanalysis, for those who don't know, is basically uh, kind of a, a, a quasi observational product. It takes a lot of the observations that are available and then effectively plugs the gaps with a, a weather model. So that's what a reanalysis product is. Uh, we have data going back, oh, and we chose that, that data set so that we could have a really good look at what was going on in the atmosphere as well uh, for this analysis and some future analyses we're planning on doing. So the data goes from 1979 to 2019 for the atmospheric variables, from 1981 to 2019 for the land variables. Uh, they have varying resolution, uh, 31 kilometres for the atmosphere and 9 kilometres for the land. We've computed evapotranspiration directly from the certain surface latent heat fluxes uh, from the ERA-5 data set, and we've computed uh, potential evapotranspiration as a function of uh, a, a, um, a set of atmospheric variables. Um, and that includes temperature, uh, specific humidity, net radiation at the surface, wind speed, and atmospheric pressure. So as I said, those metrics for assessing flash drought, people have looked at them in the past. Um, Otkin has advocated for the use of ESI. Pendergrass talked about uh, using this 
eddy, so the evaporative stress, uh, sorry, evaporative stress index is the ESI and the eddy is this uh, demand index. And you can see, I've just put down the bottom um, what they're um, kind of proportional to here. Um, and Han Nguyen from the, the Bureau of Meteorology did some great work looking at um, flash drought with the ESI in southeast Queensland and talked about its utility for monitoring. Um, a PhD student of mine, David Hoffman, has looked at uh, these, very, uh, these, these indices and climate models uh, for prediction and monitoring of, of flash drought. So we're going to show you um, similar to what David did, but in, a, in an observational framework there. So we're going to define flash drought using multiple metrics, okay? So basically they're rapid changes in these metrics um, associated with the uh, evaporative demand drought index, the um, evaporative stress index and the, the uh, standardised precipitation index, sorry. And we're going to compare this with the soil moistures from the ERA-5 data. So we're kind of, I mean, there, there are issues with the soil moistures, but we're going to call that truth, so to speak. So here, the soil moisture, we're calling it the standardised soil moisture index. Um, and basically what we're looking at all these index indices with is a 14-day aggregate. So changes uh, over a two-week period for uh, all these different indices, how rapidly they change. So for soil moisture, we're looking for a reduction from above the 40th percentile to below the 20th percentile in a two-week period. And I should say this is soil moisture uh, at the 7 to 28 centimetre level. Now this is similar to, well this is the same actually as a, as a uh, definition that was used by Ford and Lavoisier uh, in 2017, uh, but we added a criteria that it needed to remain below that 20th percentile for two weeks. The ESI, SPI and EDI uh, needed to show either a 50%, 50 percentile decrease for the former two or an increase for the EDI because we get an increase in evaporative demand associated with drought over a two week period and then that must needed to remain for at least two weeks. So that's how we define flash drought. So just to make sure everything looked kind of similar, this is what uh, the maps of uh, flash drought frequency look like in Australia. We just wanted to make sure the numbers looked about the same. So this is the percentage of days. Uh, we've kind of set the threshold so that it would be a rare event. But you can already see that uh, the spatial variability captured by um, the, the, this is the evaporative demand drought index, the, the precipitation index, standardised precipitation index, and the stress index in the bottom right compared to the, the soil moisture directly in the top left um, is quite different. So that kind of really indicates that uh, this, the land surface properties as well are quite important with respect to, to soil moisture. But this image is simply just to show you um, that, you know, they're, they're talking about flash droughts on the same scale here. So what does flash drought look like in Australia? Well, this is a temporal sequence showing, uh, basically showing variability in the proportion of area affected by flash drought in Australia uh, over, across the time series. So again, soil moisture in the top left, the evaporative demand in the top right, precipitation index in the bottom left and the evaporative stress index in the bottom right. And a couple of things uh, pop out here. First of all, that um, flash drought seems to be most prevalent in the summer in the soil index, uh, and that's reflected also in this evaporative stress index, which has been described as being a useful monitoring tool. The evaporative demand index and the, the precipitation index tend to overestimate the areas affected by flash drought. Now the other thing in the, um, in the soil moisture is that, that autumn seems to be a, a time that is important for flash drought in Australia by these definitions. Now interestingly if we just look at the correlations between the soil moisture and all three indices we get the highest correlation with the standardised precipitation index but that's not really surprising because if you have rainfall, you're not going to have a flash drought. That doesn't mean that the other indices are, are not important for identifying aspects of flash drought. So in that sense, uh, the, the ESI or the evaporative stress index uh, does a, a reasonable job at getting this variability in the soil moisture index, uh, particularly in spring and summer, it, which is what we would expect um, given that that's when you tend to get those um, that real change from that kind of uh, evapotranspiration energy limited to uh, 
water limited conditions as more likely in the spring and the summer. Now the evaporative demand doesn't show that much of uh, a relationship with the temporal variability in the area of the soil moisture index, but I suppose that's just saying that it's not evaporative demand alone that is driving flash drought variability. Now I wanted to drill down to the Wimmera very quickly. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'll go through this um, so that Tess can get through her part. Uh, but flash drought in the Wimmera, um, this is the same situation. So this is the temporal variability. So this is 1981 on the left, 2019 on the right. Uh, this shows the area under flash drought in the Wimmera according to that soil moisture index, the evaporative demand drought index, precipitation index and the evaporative stress index. Uh, again, we get substantial interannual variability. You can get some periods of no flash drought, some periods of high flash drought. Um, interestingly, these indices tend to indicate that winter is a time for flash drought according to the soil moisture in the Wimmera, which is kind of interesting given it's been described as a, a summer and spring phenomena, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, again, the eddy and the SPI overestimate flash drought. But it's interesting in the Wimmera, if you kind of drill down to specific events, we talked about 2015 being on the dry side of normal, but that's not necessary for a flash drought. This is an example from March in 1993, where you can see that kind of over 50% of the Wimmera experienced a flash drought. And if you look at the situation there, what happened was in the preceding six months um, from kind of October to March, 1993, conditions were very wet. Um, if you look at the rainfall deciles, which I don't have here, they were very much above normal for that whole period or around normal. So things were looking quite uh, wet over spring and summer. March, uh, you can see that the, this very green uh, normalised difference vegetation index indicates very healthy vegetation. This is actually above, this is the anomaly, so it's much healthier than normal for this time of year. But then by May, uh, we have that situation where it's much, it's, it's much less healthier than normal, basically. Uh, so we had a, a period of weather in April that uh, was a flash drought as well, which we won't go into detail here. But how long do flash droughts last? That was a really interesting question that we wanted to, to ask because people talk about them not necessarily being short and sharp. And we're showing here that you can, this is just an example for the Wimmera, but it's kind of true Australia wide, you can get the short, sharp ones, but you can also get these flash droughts that then kind of are the catalyst for normal seasonal scale drought. So here, um, this shows the, the uh, frequency distribution of the, the duration of flash droughts once they start. And I want you to concentrate here for the Wimmera on the summer and the autumn flash droughts, so the bottom right and the top left, because it really shows kind of bi and multimodality uh, very well. In the summer, you tend to get droughts that kind of last either just one or two months or uh, three months or longer. And in autumn in particular, you can have droughts that last for maybe a month. You can have droughts that last for about three months. But then there's also this peak out here in the sense that some of the autumn flash droughts then go on to last throughout the winter and the spring um, and kind of end up being these persistent seasonal scale droughts that we, we often see. So that was an interesting thing that we found out. We also just wanted to have a quick look between flash drought and the El Nino Southern Oscillation to look at um, kind of, you know, scope for predictability. Uh, so what this shows here is the correlation between uh, the various indices that I've described. We'll just concentrate on the SSI for all of them. This is for Australia. We looked at the Murray-Darling Basin and then at the Wimmera as well. Again, I'll just concentrate on the Wimmera because that's where we're kind of looking today. Uh, and if you have a look um, here, you see uh, a few significant relationships between uh, soil moisture indices and rainfall indices with the El Nino Southern Oscillation. But interestingly, for summer flash droughts, there is this relationship, significant relationship in the Wimmera and the Murray-Darling Basin with eddy. And it's a negative relationship. We kind of looked at this for a while and thought that's strange because this kind of indicates that evaporative demand type flash droughts or periods of rapid changes in evaporative demand tend to occur more during La Nina, which is down here, rather than El Nino, which is up here. But there is some evidence, uh, in fact, Tess Parker did this a few years ago, that 
heat waves in southeastern Australia, particularly over the Wimmera region, are more are quite closely associated with La Niña's rather than El Niño's because they're associated with the formation of tropical cyclones to Australia's north. So that was kind of an interesting outcome is that there's potential for high evaporative demand if there's potential for heat waves. And that's something we want to look at into the future. So I've gone a bit over time here, but uh, my key, the key findings that we found here was that, well, flash droughts in Australia are related to a similar sequence of processes um, that play important roles. Uh, flash droughts can be flashy, they can be quick um, in that they, they kind of come and go quickly, or they can be a catalyst for long-term seasonal scale drought and that there could be some sort of predictability here via the El Nino Southern Oscillation related to rainfall, but also potentially related to heat waves, which is what we want to look at in the future. Uh, we also looked at, at, found the fact that precipitation is really what affects flash drought risk the most. You don't have precipitation, or you do, sorry, if you do have precipitation, your risk of flash drought is low. But it's rapid changes in evaporative demand that can provide additional pre-warning risk, and that's what tests will show you but that the ESI, as um, Han Wynn's shown and as Jason Otkin showed in, uh, in North America, can really provide a great monitoring tool for flash drought ongoing. And with that, I will hand over to Tess Parker uh, and she'll talk to you uh, about the Wimmera flash drought. Thanks, Avi. So, um, good morning everyone. We'll turn now to the case study that Ailey mentioned at the start of her talk, which was in the Wimmera in the spring of 2015. So October 2015 was the warmest on record for Australia at that time. Um, monthly anomalies for mean and maximum temperatures were the largest ever recorded in Victoria. Um, mean maximum temperatures were about six degrees above average and the monthly maximum was over 25 degrees which is closer to the average for a normal december and hence the term that the abc rural news used of an october summer and several locations in victoria also recorded longer than average durations of consecutive days above 35 degrees and this is important for some of those um, crops in the Wimmera, fava beans and chickpeas in particular, do not do well at temperatures above around 27 or 30 degrees. So as Ailey showed before, we've talked about the normalized uh, difference vegetation index, uh, the values on the left and the standardized anomalies on the right. And you can see that between August into September, October, and finally into November, vegetation became increasingly stressed in the Wimmera. So what I'm interested in is looking at the atmospheric processes that underpin this flash, flash drought. So we're going to look at the synoptic conditions to give us some insight into the evolution, particularly of um, the evaporative demand drought index. So what we have here is um, weekly um, averages. So for the, the week starting at the date at the top right of each panel. And in the um, top row we have in the colours two meter temperature anomalies with blues being cooler than average and reds warmer than average. We have in the black contours percentiles of mean sea level pressure. So the higher the number the um, the more extreme the range of compared to normal of sea level pressure. In the gray dotted contours, we have percentiles of surface specific humidity. The stippling or dots show soil moisture in that layer that we're looking at of above the 40th percentile. And anywhere you have cross hatching, it's soil moisture below the 20th percentile. In the lower two panels, we have um, percentiles of net solar radiation at the surface in the colors. So lighter colors are lower than normal, darker colors are higher than normal. And the black contours here are the mean field of mean sea level pressure. And the soil moisture again is stippled and hatched as before. So you'll notice that temperature specific humidity 
um, pressure and solar radiation of all components of the evaporative demand and hence are reflected in our evaporative demand drought index. Um, so 2015 saw a drier than normal winter and it was a cool and wet start to September. You can see it's quite cool here. Um, there was a significant rain event in the second week of September um, and that brought reasonable totals. But from mid-September onwards, there's not much rainfall. Um, you can see here, uh, rainfall is largely absent after um, the middle of September. The air mass we can see here becomes quite dry with specific humidity below the 20th percentile in the north of the Wimmera and about the 40th percentile in the south. Uh, soil moisture declines below the 20th percentile. You can see cross hatching starting to emerge in the Wimmera here in the week of the 15th and the week of the 22nd. Um, mean sea level pressure, you can see from these contours, that's 0.9th percentile, 90th percentile sea level pressure, very much higher than average. And if you look in the mean field, you can see that there's a surface anticyclone centered to the west of the Wimmera. And this leads to increased and very high surface solar radiation due to the clear skies that are um, associated with uh, surface high pressure systems. So mo soil moisture is very rapidly depleted by the 22nd of, of September. Looking at the end of September and into October, surface temperatures remain very elevated anomalies of seven to eight degrees across Victoria and around five to six degrees for the Wimmera. The um, dry air mass remains at the surface. There's a little um, region of, in the north of the Wimmera where uh, soil moisture is above the 20th percentile. Surface solar radiation is still very high, around the 60th to 70th percentile. And the soil moisture continues to dry out over this period um, following weeks of high evaporative demand. So drought conditions are pretty much established within two to three weeks. Um, soil moisture dries further in the middle two weeks of October. It's actually below the 10th percentile in the Wimmera by the week of the 13th of October and below the 5th percentile in the week of the 20th. So hot spell or heat wave conditions persist. This high pressure system still dominates. There's high incoming surface solar radiation well above the 80th percentile. And the air mass is still relatively dry with values in about the 30th to 40th percentiles. So in this period, um, severe drought conditions are maintained. And you can see that in the vegetation index as before. So in summary, there's a rapid depletion of soil moisture from slightly dry to extremely dry in a period of about three weeks. Um, the rapid depletion is associated with primed semi-dry soils, um, a lack of any significant rainfall, and a very dry air mass accompanied by persistent dry, fine and hot weather um, associated with the surface anticyclone. Um, so this results in increased surface temperatures and um, high surface radiation. So this all feeds into um, changes in evaporative demand. So the evaporative demand is increasing, soil moisture is being depleted, and this results in poor outcomes for crops. Um, the rainfall doesn't come to replenish the soil moisture that, as normally expected at this time of year. So Victoria experienced actually its ninth driest September and seventh driest October on record at that time in 2015. Lower layer soy moisture was below average for much of the northern and western parts of Victoria. There was a strong, well-established El Nino in the Pacific um, associated with an increased chance of extreme temperatures in southeastern Australia in spring. And there was also a mature positive Indian Ocean dipole, which again um, contributes to the increased temperatures and the lack of rainfall. 
So this is just an example of a day in this drought. It's the 28th of October. For the standardized soil moisture index on the left, we can see in the Wimmera and in much of the state that soil moisture is depleted. We've got very low values of the index here. The evaporative demand drought index and these um, grid points are only shown for grid points at which a flash drought is present, which is why you have areas of white in the east of the state. But much of the region and indeed much of Victoria was experiencing a flash drought. Standardized precipitation index by the end of October, we can see a few areas in the north which are slightly above average, but for most of the Wimmera and the southern part of the state, um, there's no significant rainfall at all. It's very much below average. And the evaporative stress index shows that vegetation in this region is likely to be quite stressed. We're in water limited conditions here. Um, this is just an example from one single pixel or grid point in the southern Wimmera, just to illustrate to you how the indices work and how we um, uh, identify a flash drought using the indices. And I must stress that as with all reanalysis model or observational data, ERA 5 does have uncertainties in the data. We haven't attempted to um, quantify those uncertainties here, but just because I'm showing results from a single grid point doesn't mean that we're implying or suggesting that we can predict flash drought at that scale. But this is to illustrate to you how the indices work. So the evaporative demand drought index is in the golden color, the standardized precipitation index is in the blue, and the evaporative stress index is in the magenta color. And anywhere you see an asterisk is a day on which a flash drought is identified. So using the evaporative demand index, we identify the start of a flash drought here in late August. Um, and you can see the sharp decline and the maintenance of very high evaporative demand because the scale is reversed on this axis. You can also see um, flash droughts in the precipitation index. But the key point here is evaporative demand identifies a flash drought. Evaporative stress index follows the flash drought by a couple of weeks. So evaporative st stress doesn't give a flash drought, but it shows a large rapid decline after the onset of flash drought indicated by evaporative demand. So evaporative demand has the potential to pre-warn of a flash drought, where evaporative stress perhaps is more useful for monitoring drought conditions. So what are our key findings for this, this case study? Um, conditions deteriorated from around the dry normal to severe drought in just three to four weeks from mid-September. This flash drought event was associated with a persistent perhaps heat wave, definitely um, sustained periods of hot days, so a hot spell. And flash drought perhaps here represents a true compound event. We talk a lot about compound events, but I think true compound events are events that are connected by the dynamic processes in the atmosphere and the land surface that lead to um, compounding results. So perhaps heat waves lead to drought. And in turn, when we have drought and we have depleted soil moisture at the surface, we get increased surface um, sensible heat fluxes, which increase the surface temperatures again. So drought in turn contributes to heat waves. And we see the signatures of um, the flash drought event in both evaporative demand and evaporative stress indices. What we want to do in the future is more closely investigate um, the connection between flash droughts and heat waves as compound events. That's very interesting. Um, and again, the synoptic precursors to flash drought events indicate that perhaps subseasonal prediction of flash droughts may be possible. We know that numerical weather prediction models um, predict 
heat waves in this region quite well. They get the atmospheric dynamics really well. So a closer look at the role of evaporative demand in heat waves in flash drought um, is warranted. Um, and looking at the implications in, in a warming climate is also extremely interesting. I think this is something that we could probably do quite well. And with that, um, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks Tess and thanks Ailey. Um, so we do have some great questions that have come through. Just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat box. But seeing as we just finished with you, Tess, I might start with a question that was directed specifically at you. Um, so you Dave- a presentation up for people or? Um, just leave it, I think, how it is, okay. Tess, and you can scroll back then if, if you need to look at a graph or something. Right. So David Hoffman um, asked, Tess, did anomalous wind conditions also contribute to the flash drought development in the Wimmera, given that it's an eddy driver? Thanks, David. Um, it is an eddy driver, as you would very well know, because you've done a lot of, of work on eddy as well. Um, wind is one of the components of the index. We haven't shown it here. And I think given that we're in an, a persistent anti-cyclone throughout this period, winds are likely to be light. We're not in a prefrontal condition or anything like that. Um, so I think evaporative demand here is more driven by the surface temperature and the dry air mass than it would be by wind. But certainly wind is one of the components and we would look at that in, in an in-depth study. Great, thanks Tess. Um, you finished off there saying that in the future you'd like to look at flash drought under a changing climate. And so we have a question from Neil asking, is there any information to date on how frequency and severity of flash droughts could be impacted by climate change? Is there, is there anything that's been done to date on that? I might throw that one to Ailey as the, uh, the um, expert. <laughs> thanks Neil. No, look, to my knowledge, not in Australia. Um, and I think this is an area that we would really like to get into in the sense that um, oh, it's probably a bit hard to go back now, but if some of the, for example, the eddy uh, type of indices indicated, you know, they, if you just look at them, there's, there's quite strong trends, strong increases in, in flash droughts as de defined by the eddy. Now that's probably driven by temperature because temperature is a strong component of potential evaporation. But in that sense, I suppose it kind of, it depends how important that evaporative demand process is um, in, in flash drought progression. And we've shown an example where it is quite important. So um, in that sense, it's, it's a potential, yes, but it's something that we would like to look into, but not to my knowledge, nobody's looked into it yet. Fabulous, right. And you both sort of touched on uh, heat waves when talking about flash drought too. And we've got a few questions coming in around that. Anna asks, what distinguishes a flash drought from a heat wave? The processes initiating a flash drought sound similar to uh, a heat wave. Would either of you like to comment on that one? Yeah, I can, I can take that one if that's okay, Tess. Um, so Anna, I think you're exactly right. Um, and I think, I think for a severe flash drought like this, um, yes, a, a flash drought might just be a heat wave and basically the land surface response to that. But I suppose the, the big question we have is, you know, is the Venn diagram for a, a heat wave and a flash drought like this, or is it, you know, um, what's the crossover here? Does a heat wave, um, I mean, a heat wave is not necessarily always going to cause a flash drought, but are flash droughts always associated with heat waves? Um, that's that's a, a big question that we have that, was kind of the next thing that we want to look at. Fabulous, and sort of keeping on the heat wave sort of theme, David asks, um, Ali has focused on the impacts of flash drought and soy mo on soy mo moisture and agriculture. Are there also feedbacks and impacts of flash drought on occurrence of severe heat waves or extreme grass fire danger? Would you like me to take that one, Tess? <laughs> or would you like to answer this one? Worth my, yeah. Um, I think, Obviously, surface feedbacks are important in heat waves, and some work that I think Annetta Hirsch and Malcolm King have done have shown that um, when you get increased surface sensible heating, that does tend to 
increase the severity of a heat wave. You already have a heat wave, but it's a little bit hotter because you get increased sensible heating at the surface. Um, so I think they, they are connected. Um, I would wonder in this connection between heat waves and flash droughts about the time period. Um, I don't think we have heat waves that last months. Um, not when you define them as extreme heat waves, but I think when you have hot spells and flash droughts, that feedback between the land surface and the atmosphere becomes important and it's a component of both things. Did you want to add to that, Ailey? Or you... No, I think, I think Tess covered it quite well. Um, I suppose I'd just say that I think uh, there are certainly implications when Tess and I first discussed this uh, when when we started on this work, uh, fire danger was one of the things that we discussed. Um, absolutely. So again, there's there's lots of avenues to go down with this work. Um, there really is a lot of stuff to do because it, it hasn't really been looked at too closely. So I would also add, if I may, on that point, that um, the evaporative demand drought index is something that feeds into. Um, fire danger indices in North America. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily appropriate for Australia. I think we have to be careful about regions and vegetation types and seasons and that sort of thing. But it's certainly something that they look at because that evaporative demand has such an impact on vegetation. Okay, great, thanks for that. Um, we have another question from Marion who says, um, on the NVI maps, the national parks seem to stand out, the Grampians, Little Desert, um, Murray Sunset. Prior to the flash drought, they look worse than surrounding agricultural land and then look better through the worst of the flash drought. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, and is there sort of like a, a link with native vegetation having a better ability to ho hold moisture? Oh, I think that's, I mean, I'm, I'm not um, an expert on the, the, um, the NDVI, but I, I think that's probably what it is, just different vegetation response. Um, you know, I'm, that's that's my guess too, but I, I can't comment too closely on that. It might be, you know, it might be how the, the satellite retrievals work for different um, vegetation types and things as well. Um, but yeah, that's that would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question from Virginia who asked, does agri um, irrigated agriculture change how flash drought presents? I think it would um, at the farm scale, um, for sure. I think, you know, if you've got irrigated agriculture, you've certainly got um, a lot. Well, you, you have more of you. Theoretically, you would have more input from that kind of. You'd have more evapotranspiration for one um, because you'd have more available moisture at the surface but I suppose it kind of depends how quickly and how fast you could irrigate. Um, I suppose an interesting question for me from there would be, you know, if you had large enough areas of irrigation, what would the feedback on the, like if there is an associated heat wave like the Wimmera, what would the feedback on the, the heat wave be? Um, you know, would that act to um, moderate surface temperatures a little bit, or is that largely driven by the synoptic scale environment um, and, and what effect would that have on the subsequent crops? I think that's a really good question. I might also add that in the, the Wimmera case study that we were looking at in the ABC Rural News report, there was one farmer who um, either serendipitously had better soil moistures than his neighbours or did more irrigation perhaps, and he had a reasonable crop where people two kilometers down the road were having their crops wiped out. So it's a very um, fine grained thing, I suppose, depending on soil types, crop types, and obviously irrigation. Fabulous, okay. Um, so another question from Sumanta. Uh, in your opinion, which index is the best to describe flash drought? Is it SSMI or another? And um, how do you think in the future we can go about predicting flash, flash drought? I think that's a big question to unpack. Um, <laughs> so I don't think there is one best index to de describe flash drought. I think it depends what um, aspect of flash drought you want to look at. Um, you know, Han Nguyen from the Bureau and David Hoffman have shown and 
Tessie has shown that the ASI is really great for identifying flash droughts for sure. But, um, you know, Tess's work and David Hoffman's work also shows that um, it does, Tess showed you in a time series, that it, it does tend to, to lag the, what we might describe as the onset of the flash drought a little bit. Now that might only be a matter of, of a week or two, but you know, that potentially matters. And in that sense, um, the evaporative demand drought index seems to have some sort of small predictive capacity in the sense that it kind of started um, to, to drop rapidly uh, more soon, uh, sooner than the ESI, than the evaporative stress index. But that said, you've got a much higher, uh, what we call false alarm rate. So, you know, you, you can have these situations with the evaporative demand drought index where it, it looks like a flash drought, but it doesn't actually result in a flash drought. Um, so it's, it seems to be, and that's, other people have found that too, that they've, they've got much higher false alarm rates. So I think it's really not, you know, there's not kind of a silver bullet, oh yeah, let's just look at this index. I think um, that it's one of those things that you kind of need to monitor for risk, you know, the, uh, the precipitation shuts off, okay, well, what's the soil moisture doing? All right, well, now we need to have a look, you know, on sub-seasonal timescales and forecasts coming up. Uh, to see if there's a situation like a heat wave, for example, where your, your um, evaporative demand would increase rapidly and then monitor that, for example, using the, the um, evaporative stress index. And in that sense, I think that kind of predictive framework would work a lot better than just relying on a, a single index, for example. But Tess might have more input on that. No, I think that's right. And I think... Um you know, researchers in the US who, who have developed this index, um, Mike Hobbins is, in particular has said that evaporative demand is a really useful index, but it possibly needs refining for different regions. Um, and it probably needs to be combined with other indices in order to give sort of a fully rounded picture of what's happening. But I think it's really useful in highlighting the role of the atmosphere um, in drought where we've got the standardized precipitation index is basically looking at the water supply and the evaporative stress index is looking at sort of what happens to vegetation at the surface but the eddy is giving us um, a really good insight into the, the meteorological processes that might tip things into a drought. So I think a rounded approach of a combination of indices is probably wise. Great, fantastic. Okay, well, um, considering that we're, we've reached time, I might end it there. Um, a big thank you to Tess and Ailey um, for your fantastic presentations and for everyone who's attended um, for giving up your time and for the great questions that have come through. Just a reminder that there will be a recording of the webinar um, in case you want to share it with anyone and a uh, email will go around by the end of the week um, providing the link to you. If you do have any questions or inquiries about today's webinar, there are some contact details for the Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub up on the screen now. Please don't hesitate to get in touch. If you have any questions for Tess or Ailey, just email them to that um, inbox on the screen and I'll um, make sure that they get those questions and get back to you. So um, just a quick note as well that this is the last Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub webinar for 2020. So thank you to all those who are repeat um, offenders and, and turn up to all of our webinars. We really appreciate your interest and engagement, um, but we do hope to see you in the new year. So thank you again for attending and um, I hope you have a fantastic Christmas and New Year's season. So thank you. <laughs>